pass it and just spit it out. You don't have time to be rereading it for the first three for the first time. So you want to be sure when you walk in your midterm that you've read carefully. We have a paper due before the midterm, but I'm getting ahead of myself. But this is a practice that you want to have. Hopefully you read that section that I gave you in uh, the West Guide about close reading. And that's the, that's the skill that you guys are practicing by doing this. And studies have shown that when you put pen to paper and actually try to verbalize or write down uh, what you're going to do both today, your points, it kind of gets in there better, right? And it, another step happens that makes you more analytical. So the context part is really important. This paraphrase is really important because that's how you start out in the midterm. You have a passage, and then you give us one sentence to say, OK, who's talking? Where are we? What's going on? Then you launch into the analysis of why it's important, the so what factor. So the ground rules for this are you need to listen to your classmates, right? Because you don't want to be spending the whole time that I'm talking and that they're talking so worried about what you're going to say that you only have thought about your four pages and miss everything else. So it's important that you listen to everybody else and that you follow along in the book. So my first group, page 19 to 23. What's going on in this passage? Oh, OK. So um, <coughs> the passage starts out um, with some cola taking the Shirley Temple cup and the, um, the milk. And they start talking about Shirley Temple. Good. And Frida and Cola start talking about it. But Claudia doesn't have the same affection for Shirley Temple as they do. And in one of the passages, she says, um, I hated Shirley, not because she was cute, but because she danced with Bojangles, who is my friend, my uncle, my daddy, and who I've been stop shooting me and shuffling with me. Good. Kind of showing that how she felt about that relationship. It wasn't, it's not real, it's fabricated because in real life it, would, it wouldn't be like they wouldn't be in that situation. Or more like she relates to Bojangles more than she does Shirley and she can't understand why Nicole and Frida are relating to her. Right, it doesn't seem fair. Yeah. She says Shirley Temple already has all those adults, those white adults adoring her, right? They actually say in the movie they worship her, right? A failing comment to all parents. She says she doesn't get him too, he's for me. It's not fair, right? So she starts out talking about Shirley Temple, and why does this whole Shirley Temple, let's remember, why does the whole Shirley Temple incident make Mrs. Uh, McTeer mad? Drink Who drinks a bunch of milk? Uh, Pecola. Why is she drinking three quarts of milk? No little girl, 11 year old girl, needs to drink three quarts of milk. So by drinking that milk, the idea is she gets closer to Shirley Temple, or she may be Shirley Temple if she drinks out of that Shirley Temple cup, right? So in your passage, you have Shirley Temple, and then Toni Morrison is really brilliant about making these connections. What does that connect into a discussion about? The Christmas doll. The Christmas doll. The Christmas doll. And how does that connection work between Shirley Temple? What's the connection between Shirley Temple and the doll? The parents. Uh, so at a younger age, to give the little black girl dolls or whatever to show affection to little white girls. I don't know if I can jump ahead of myself to other chapters. Well, you're, no, no, that's fine, but just on a very basic level, you're overthinking it, you're being too smart. What, how does Shirley Temple connect to the doll? Ricky, I'm going to stick with my group for the moment. Okay, um, I guess the doll of the other. I knew that the doll represented what they thought was my fondest wish, and it would be basically what Bojangles was doing with Shirley Temple, and that in taking care of the doll who looked like Shirley Temple, that's exactly what they wanted you to become, like basically its mother and take her. Basically still like a like slave, and you still have to take care of it every which way. Well, what's the, let's say we didn't see a movie, and we just knew who Shirley Temple was, and then we saw that part from Shirley Temple. It's a doll. It's really simple, super simple. You guys are being too smart. What's represented? She's like the doll, isn't she? And what is the doll like? Simple. White, blonde, white, blonde, blue eyes, right? That that is for some reason, she says, the ideal of beauty. Of beauty, and who made that up? We don't know. Some random adults, but who knows? All the books that they were giving to the little kids to read the Jane and from the primers of the reason, they can't good. And other sources, but some adults, some random adults decided that blonde blue eyes was the ideal, and that's not fair, right? Have you guys heard the story of the Emperor's New Clothes? Mm -hmm. 
that story where, so there's an emperor, right? Uh, I'm going to tell this really badly, I'm sorry. But there's an emperor, and for some reason, his tailor doesn't have the suit he needs, so he lies to him, and he says, well, here, just put this suit on, which is not a suit, it's nothing. But he pretends it's a suit, and he says, oh, but it's really special, you can only see it if you're a really good person, and you're really smart, right? So the emperor doesn't want to be embarrassed, so he, puts on, he pretends to put on the suit, and he walks around naked. And all the people around him are too embarrassed to say, well, you're naked, right? But it takes a little boy who says it like it is and says, he's walking around naked. Why is he walking around naked, right? And so then the whole thing falls apart. But it's a little bit the same thing with Claudia, right? She's the little boy. She's saying, well, who decided blonde and blue eyes was beautiful? We're all accepting that. All the adults, uh, even the adults in her world, have accepted that, right? But who said? Who said it's supposed to be that way? Good. What else do you have for your passage? Um, what I was trying to get into was that giving them the doll at a young age shows them affection. Like to give little white girls affection or whatever. This how Coca-Cola's mom gave more affection to Laura girls she was taken care of yeah. than Coca-Cola. Good. That's Good. what I was trying to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be too smart. It's good to be too smart. No, you're right. You're right. Mrs. Breedlove shows more affection to the little girl that she works for than she does to her own daughter, right? Mm -hmm. For sure. And that's um, what they're trying to give the dolls to the black girls to show more affection to the little white doll than their own child. Good. It shows the ideal, doesn't it? It shows that this doll is the ideal. It's more ideal than you, the child. Yeah. And of course, it creates a sense of unworthiness, right? A it's lack of self-worth. It's also put in her, um, her place in her lineage when you're not supposed to be afraid and everybody knows that and you have to accept it by liking something else that is not like you. Right, but Claudia, does she accept it? No. no. At first she's like the little boy. She says, no way, I'm not accepting this. And did we read through this passage together already? We go through the violence of the chapter, of this section. In this section, as she's re as she's going through it, she's actually breaking the spell apart, isn't she? Yeah, she's looking for that little ah, thing inside that says mama. You know that little. It's like the cow, so you turn over. It's got the discs that she finds inside. Uh, but it's very violent, isn't it? The way she looks at it. She likes it. Yeah. Yeah. Here they said, this is beautiful, and if you are on this day worthy, you may have it. I fingered the face, wondering at the single stroke eyebrows, picked at the pearly teeth stuck like two piano keys between red bowline lips. Traced the turned up nose, poked the glassy blue eyeballs. Again, blue eyeballs. Blue eyes, imagery everywhere. Twisted the yellow hair, I could not love it, but I could examine it to see what it was that all the world said was lovable. Break off the tiny fingers, bend the flat feet, loosen the hair, twist the head around, and the thing made one sound. A sound they said was the sweet and plaintive cry mama, but which sounded to me like the bleat of a dying lamb. Or more precisely, our icebox door opening on rusty hinges. <coughs> Remove the cold and stupid eyeball, it would bleed still. So she's actually taking this thing apart quite violently. How does she make the transference then to real little girls at the end of that passage? She wants to be violent towards them, right? She says on the bottom of 22, but the dismembering of dolls is not the true horror. What was the true horror? She wanted to do the same thing to the real... She wanted to do the same thing to the real little white girls, right? The truly horrifying thing was the transference of the same impulses to little white girls. The indifference with which I could have asked them was shaken only by my desire to do so to discover what eluded me, the secret of the magic they weaved on others. What made people look at them and say, oh, but not for me? The eyes slide of black women as they approach them on the street and the possessive gentleness of their touch as they handle them. If I pinched them, their eyes, unlike the crazed glint of the baby doll's eyes, would fold in pain. And their cry would not be a sound of a nice box door, but a fascinating cry of pain. When I learned how repulsive this disinterested violence was, that it was repulsive because it was disinterested, my shame floundered about for refuge. The best hiding place was love. Thus the conversion from pristine sadism to fabricated hatred to fraudulent love. It was a small step to Shirley Temple. I learned much later to worship her just as I learned to delight in cleanliness, knowing even as I learned that the change was adjustment without improvement. What is she describing here, this kind of violence? Well. 
she's made these little white girls into, what are they to be compared with? Shirley Temple or the doll, right? And she's saying, well, if I poke the little white girl's eye like I poke the Shirley Temple doll's eye, or, or the doll's eye, they actually make a noise, but there's this, it's kind of objectification, right? What's a psychopath? <laughs> Do you know a psychopath, a sociopath, or a psychopath? It just enjoy killing people. Yeah, psychopaths inflict like pain on people or kill people. And how are they able to do that? Well, psychiatrists say that they're able to inflict pain on people because they don't see them as people. They see their victims as objects, yeah. right? They see their victims as objects, and so they don't have empathy for them. And I'm not saying that Claudia's a psychopath. She's not, right? She's horrified by that instinct. But that first little instinct is anger, isn't it? That first instinct is violence that she has. What brings on that feeling? It's a feeling of unworthiness, right? She's not worthy enough, worthy enough to appreciate this doll, and her resultant desire is to inflict violence. Who does that foreshadow for you? Sure. Charlie, good, Charlie. exactly, Charlie, right? Charlie, who has had such a tough upbringing that his whole sense of worth is really compromised, has no choice but to inflict anger or violence, right? That's Junior, too. Junior also, exactly, excellent, Junior, that's right. So we have a couple of examples. It's not that he has no choice. I don't mean to imply he has no choice. Of course he has a choice. But we see, even in someone like a little girl like Claudia, this instinct, right? It's a little bit scary. Um, good, very good. One thing I wanted to say about the dying lamb, the dying lamb of the ma uh, baby doll. Why do you think Pecola's name is not Piola, but Pecola? Well, I have one theory for you. And my theory is that that little C went in there because the root of this word uh, becomes sin. And Pecola, I would argue to you, just think about this as you, read, as you think through the rest of the book, as you finish it for next class. Pecola is in some ways this sacrifice for everybody in the book. Isn't she? Yeah. How do sacrifices, the reason I bring up dying lamb is because it reminds me of a sacrificial animal, right? And this doll is being sacrificed in a way so that Claudia can understand the root of beauty. Who's the ultimate lamb who, in, in Western thought? Jesus, right? Lamb of God, right? It's important to know this stuff, even if you're not Christian, because it comes up in so many books and, and texts, and it's good to know the story. So Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? It's also something that goes back to the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. Why did we go roast a lamb on, we, you know, ancient Greeks, go roast a lamb on the, on the mountaintop to the gods? What was the idea of a sacrifice? Unworthy. Yes. Yes. If you sacrifice something, you get something in return from the gods if they were pleased by what you gave them. Well, or if you've been partying too hard, you haven't been a really good Greek, you haven't been going and doing what you need to do to the gods, right? If you sacrifice this lamb, the gods will get mad at you. You would take it away all your sins. Right, the same with Jesus, right? The, the, the idea goes, Jesus died on the cross so that everybody else who was bad could still have a chance of making it into heaven, right? In the same way, notice how Coca-Cola appears, and you'll notice the language of sacrifice, right? How about those boys who are beating her up? There's a whole passage there that we'll talk about in a little bit, but we get the idea that these boys are so are feeling so unworthy about themselves that if they can make Coca-Cola suffer, Coca-Cola acts like the sacrifice, right? At least they're not as bad as Coca-Cola. And that's how the rest of the whole character world here seems to treat her, right? that she's the sacrifice for everybody else so that they can feel better about themselves. Right, it's, a, it's an awful thing. Good, you guys did a good job with that. Okay, my next group, 47 to 50. I've got two groups, so who, do, who did 47? Oh, but Jeremy's gonna start us off on 45 and show us how imagery works on page 45. I just wanted to trace the eyeball imagery and show you how it works on 45. Um, so on that page, Nicole was doing her 45. meditation about um, trying to make herself, visualize herself disappearing. Um, but uh, she can't get rid of her eyes and um, says that all of her 
memories and visions and stuff are stored in them. So when she sit, and she says that her eyes are everything, and uh, in saying that, she resigns herself to the idea that appearance is what makes everything real because it's all she knows about. Good. So we're at that passage. That's good. So just to recap, on page forty-five, Pacola is listening to her parents fighting. She's in the same room. There's nowhere where she can go, right? So what does she do? She clamps her eyes shut as tight as she can, right? And she can make her whole body, she has the illusion to herself that she can make her whole body disappear, her arms or legs. Because that's what she wants. She wants to disappear as any child would and get out of this situation. But the one thing that she can't make disappear are what? Her eyes. Her eyes. Why do you think these eyes are so important? They've seen so much. What have they seen? Yes, absolutely. Is that what you're saying, Andrea? Yes. Yeah, through her eyes, she's taking in all of this bad stuff around her, right, Janae? And she, she wants blue eyes because um, everyone will say that, oh, no, we can't do that in front of those pretty eyes. Excellent. So she wants blue eyes. So there's two parts to this eye imagery, right? She wants to close her eyes because she doesn't want to see the ugliness around her. But at the same time, if everyone were blind, right, she wouldn't have a problem, would she? Because she feels like the root of her problems is because of the way she looks. It's a very superficial thing. So if people weren't able to see her, also she wants to disappear, then she wouldn't be judged because she has the feeling that people are judging her because she's ugly, because she's not worthy, right? So uh, only her tight, tight eyes were left. They were always left. Try as she might, she could never get her eyes to disappear. So what was the point? They were everything. Everything was there in them. All of those pictures, all of those faces. She had long ago given up the idea of running away to see new pictures, new faces, as Sammy had so often done. Uh, he never took her. It wouldn't have worked anyway. As long as she looked the way she did, as long as she was ugly, she would have to stay with these people. Somehow she belonged to them. Long hours she sat looking in the mirror, trying to discover the secret of the ugliness, the ugliness that made her ignored or despised at school by teachers and classmates alike. So while Claudia is trying to rip apart the doll to find the beauty, Pecola is staring in the mirror trying to find the ugly. And they're not going to find it, either one, because it's an arbitrary thing. There's no, it's a random thing that has no sense. There's no logic to it. But she's looking for the ugliness, like, but it's not there. It's just a perception that she has. That's right. But she's trying to make it materialize. And there's nothing she, she doesn't understand. Yeah, which is why she understood the whole thing about the blue eyes so thoroughly, right? Yeah. Excellent. Let's go on to your pages so I don't, 47 to 50. What is, what's happening in this scene? Uh, McCoy is going on her way um, to um, a mini mart. Right. Mary Jane Candy, and she adores so much, and um, she experiences. I I believe in in the book her first bout with uh, racism. Okay. Do you think it's her first one? No. Well, I think it's it's the one that really cuts deep, um, just from the uh, imagery and how how um, Toni Morrison puts uh, these words that make. You Feel yeah, how she felt. yeah, it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. I would argue it's not her first experience with it. It's the first one we see directly, maybe, and because it feels so immediate, it feels very personal to us, right? Mm -hmm. But she's going to buy Mary Jane. That's what a Mary Jane looks like. Uh, why does she like Mary Jane so much? Because mm -hmm. well, on the picture it has an image of the white ideal. Um, view as she wants to see with herself, the fair skin, so that it has blue eyes. Yeah, does it have blue eyes? She says it has blue eyes. Does it have blue eyes? Not on that one, but it says it in the book, but I don't see any blue eyes. What else? It also says she has blonde hair in the book. Do you see any blonde hair in there? No. How come? I'm sure Toni Morrison knew what a Mary Jane looked like. Why do you think that's there's that difference there? 
she she has that image of what beauty is, and now she applies it to everything. That yeah. She yeah, she's so obsessed with this idea of blonde hair and blue eyes. She figures if you're a little girl who has her face on a candy wrapper, you must be blonde, blue eyed, right? Even though the reality, there's a disjunction there between the reality and what, and what she's thinking. Okay. She likes it because she can put it in her mouth, and it's just like the milk. It's exactly like the milk. Explain how that is. Okay, she can put it in her mouth. Okay. She doesn't believe anything can be closer than beauty or even candy. Good. They even talk about orgasm. They do, they do. Jeremy. Yeah, like there was um, not like a Freudian thing necessarily, but um, yeah, that's a, that's one of the first ways that as like infants we explore the world is through like tasting things. Yeah. So and whatnot. So I don't know. She seems kind of stunned. Yes. Andres? It'd probably also be like a way of like comfort. Like when you're like being nursed by your mom, you remember I guess being breastfed. So as she grew up, she wanted to continue being, like, I guess, loved. So she, that's why most people turn to food when they're feeling depressed or an emotional, I guess, lack of happiness. Yeah, it's definitely a way of soothing, right? Of self-soothing for herself, for sure. It's the one thing that's not gonna, it's the one thing for poor Picola in this book. Every single time she gets her hopes up that something's gonna end up good in her life, it's completely dashed and frustrated, like the first sentences of the book, right? Remember the frustration? Nothing was the way we expected it to be. For this, it's the same for her. Every time we go into the scene, that scene with Junior with the cat, every time we think, oh, Maureen, there's going to be a little bit of light for poor Picola. Nothing. Gives us nothing. The only thing you can count on is Mary Jane, because when you open it, at least it just always tastes the same, right? And you know it's there. And it's just like drinking from the, from the Shirley Temple cup. Remy, were you saying? Oh no. Uh, um, back of what she said about the milk. It's like consuming Mary Jane. She yeah. becomes something. Yeah. Like she says, um, to Piccola, the, the eyes are petulant, mischievous. Well, I'll read a little before. A picture, each pale yellow wrapper has a picture on it. A picture of little Mary Jane for whom the candy is named. Smiling, white face, blonde hair in gentle disarray, blue eyes looking at her out of a world of clean comfort. That's a lot to take from that little sketch. <laughs> um, the eyes are petulant, mischievous, not unlike Shirley Temple's eyes, right? We saw Shirley Temple over there. To Piccola, they are simply pretty. She eats the candy and its sweetness is good. To eat the candy is somehow to eat the eyes, eat Mary Jane, love Mary Jane, be Mary Jane, right? If she can ingest it, if she can get as close as she can, it's just like drinking three quarts of milk from that Shirley Temple glass. Getting that much closer, putting it in her body, it will be her. Yes. Now, did you guys have anything to say about the dandelions? Yeah. Excellent. Let's hear about the dandelions. Um, On page 47. Yeah, that's true. Is that how you divvied it up? Are they the same page? They have the same page. Okay, then we'll let them Thank you. Well, it's like she. Um, the dandelions and the concrete and all the things are, they're a part of her, they become a part of her because she, she seems to not relate to any other aspect of life or it's not accepted. But these inanimate objects don't make her feel ugly or less than. So she goes in thinking that they're, that they're beautiful. But she comes out thinking that they're not because of the reaction she has with the storekeeper. Good, let's break yeah. that down because this is a really important emotional beat that sets up other emotional beats in the story. How does she feel about the dandelions before she goes into the store? She thinks they're beautiful. Are dandelions beautiful? Yeah. yeah. What is it? What does the book tell us about it? Well, people who consider them weeds. There are weeds. She thinks they're beautiful, and adults say they're weeds. Who decided dandelions were weeds? Does that remind you of anything? But yeah, the beauty, the beautiful thing with the... It's the same as the doll, right? Yeah. Who said a white baby doll is prettier than a black baby doll? Some arbitrary person somewhere, and people decided to accept it, right? It's the same with the dandelion. How many of you have little brothers and sisters? I'm sure you've gotten your... I know I've got my share of dandelion bouquets in my life because we're kids. Oh, there's these pretty yellow flowers. They're free. No one cares if you pick them. Here you go. And you know, right? Sorry. Recently, a little boy gave me one. It's the same thing. Just a wilt. But he just like... He said, you sure have flowers for you. And it was because it's a flower. It's a flower. And he thought it was beautiful. Yeah. And, and you she, look, you turned up your nose. I can tell by the way you're standing. He's pouring out his heart behind no, it. And you're like, you don't want to I really didn't. I didn't. I, I, I said, oh, it's beautiful. 
page, and you know, not checking in the house, saying, where's your flower? And I said, oh, it's over here. <laughs> <laughs> because for him, what's the difference between a dandelion and a marigold? Nothing. They look a lot yeah. alike. I mean, they don't look exactly alike. I know that. But marigolds are what's planted even in this book in the very last pages, right? You have to send away for those seeds. You have to cultivate the marigolds, even though they're still little yellow flowers, right? For a kid, he gave you a bouquet of roses. It was the same thing for him, right? Um, it's, again, this arbitrariness, right? Uh, who said? Who said a dandelion is the most beautiful flower in the world, right? She tells us here. The dandelions at the base of the telephone pole. Why, she wonders, do people call them weeds? She thought they were pretty. But grown-ups say, Miss Dunyon keeps her yard so nice, not a dandelion anywhere. Hunky women in black babushkas go into the fields with baskets to pull them up. But they do not want the yellow heads, only the jagged leaves. They make dandelion soup, dandelion wine. Nobody loves the head of a dandelion, maybe because they are so many, strong, and soon. Then she has her encounter with Mr. Yakubowski. We'll talk about that in a second. But when she leaves the store, she thinks about the dandelions again. And what does she say about the dandelions then? They are ugly. Yeah, they are. A dart of affection leaps out from her to them, but they do not look at her and do not send love back. This is the difference on page 50. After that encounter, that negative account, encounter with Mr. Yakubowski. They are ugly, they are weeds. Preoccupied with the revelation, she trips on the sidewalk crack. Anger stirs and wakes in her. It opens its mouth and like a hot mouth puppy, laps up the drudges of her shame. First of all, what kind of figure of speech is that? Metaphor. Not a metaphor? It's a, it's, a it's a simile, how do we know? Like, it has like. And what are the two things being compared? With what? What's the hot mouth puppy? When we have a comparison, we have to have two things. What are the two things? Hot mouth puppy is compared is her anger. Her anger is a hot mouth puppy, like a hot mouth puppy. So it's a simile. So notice here. You, have you guys heard that thing where you know the dad has a bad day? Well, this is totally stereotypical of family roles and everything. But forgive me for one second. So this old thing where the dad has a bad day at work and he comes home and yells at the wife, who yells at the kids, who kicked the dog, who chases the cat, who kills the mouse, right? <laughs> the idea is if you're feeling unworthy or upset or shamed in some way, the resulting emotion is anger lots of times. But you can't really be angry at the person. The dad can't be angry at his boss because he might lose his job, right? This relay of power goes down where you can only pick on the person who's less powerful than you are. Yeah. And Picola is so powerless, right? She has no power in her life. Only a dandelion can be the recipient of her anger, and it is. So notice that even just like Claudia gets angry at the doll, right? Her, and then at the girls, the little white girls, right? That the doll represents. In the same way, Picola feels that anger. But she's not an angry person, and it doesn't last, right? Her anger is a hot mouth puppy. When your anger's a puppy, you're not a very angry person, right? And then the puppy just goes to bed, and she feels bad about herself again, right? That's what it tells us. Anger is better. It's better than shame, because she felt shamed and unworthy by Mr. Jakubowski. And this is page 50. Anger is better. There's a sense of being in anger, a reality and presence, an awareness of worth. It is a lovely surgeon. Her thoughts fall back to Mr. Jakubowski's eyes, his phlegmy voice. The anger will not hold. The puppy is too easily surfeited. His thirst too quickly quenched. It sleeps. The shame wells up again. It's muddy rivulets seeping into her eyes. What to do before the tears come? She remembers the Mary Jane. And again, as Andres was saying, the comfort then of the candy makes sense. So uh, notice this anger, right? It all stems, anger all stems, and, and violence, really, ultimately, always stems from a feeling of unworthiness, right? Because if you felt, and powerlessness, if you felt like you had power, you wouldn't resort to violence. Violence is what you resort to when you don't have power in a situation. Yeah, uh, I hate to bring, like, look at the story through only this lens, but yeah, again, in psychology, like, when infants aren't cared for, like, that lack of attention turns to rage. Yeah. Like, and, and the whole, like, oral fixation that she has is associated with passivity. So that's kind of why I felt like the leveling off of the book was okay. 
like we talked about, but. Well, I don't think you should feel shy either about psychoanalyzing the book because Toni Morrison herself sure is inviting us to do that, yeah. right? She says, because the why is too hard, I'll explain the how, right? We can't go into why, but let's see how this happened. And that's why she goes back to give the backstories of Charlie, of Pauline, to show how they develop into the people they are, because for her, there's a clear explanation there, right? Uh, leaving apart the fact that we always have a choice, right? And she seems to act like he doesn't have a choice, but that's another, that's another issue. So let's just quickly look at Mr. Yakubowski. What imagery do you notice in that passage on page 48? What happens in that passage where she's talking or not talking? She walks in the store, she's happy to buy her Mary Jane, she can't wait, got her three pennies. I've got eight people here who talked about this passage, I'm gonna concentrate on you guys. What imagery is there in that? The gray head of Mr. Yakubowski looms up over the counter. He urges his eyes out of his thoughts to encounter her. I love that sentence. Have you ever been so lost in your thoughts you don't know what you're looking at? Or you, you ever this is really scary to admit, but have you ever driven somewhere and you're like, wait, how did I get here? I've been, I've been thinking about something. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've parked my car and I walk out of the store and I'm like, hmm. No idea. Absolutely no idea. I'm so in my thoughts, right? So here, he's thinking about something, and he's urging his eyes out of his thoughts to notice this little girl, right? Blue eyes, blear drooped, slowly, like Indian summer, moving imperceptibly toward fall, he looks toward her. Somewhere between retina and object, between vision and view, his eyes draw back, hesitate, and hover. At some fixed point in time and space, he senses that he need not waste the effort of a glance. He does not see her, because for him, there is nothing to see. How can a 52-year-old white immigrant storekeeper with a taste of potatoes and beer in his mouth, his mind honed on the doe-eyed Virgin Mary, his sensibilities blunted by a permanent awareness of loss, see a little black girl? Nothing in his life even suggested that the feat was possible, not to say desirable or necessary. What's the imagery? What's the overwhelming imagery here? You guys aren't off the hook yet. Well, I'm still on your pages. <laughs> Stephen, what, that, what imagery do you notice there? What kind of idea is repeated over and over? What are you doing? Yeah. What image? What are we looking at here in this passage? She's, like she's nobody. She's nobody. Why? Because she's invisible. Uh, it talks about his eyes. It's lot. about eyes. It's about eyes and vision. That's what this re between retina and object. Every word and every sentence almost recalls us of, of this double-edged sword, right? There are both the eyes in her head, the eyes of people, and there's the vision. There's what they're seeing. And she is not being seen. Somewhere between retina and object, he decides that she's not worth seeing. Right? That's a decision. He's got blue eyes. Jill. It's also connected to the guideline where it says they do not look at her and do not send love back. Yes. Excellent. How is that connected? That's perfectly right. He's, um, she's comparing the dandelions to his man. How, how he's ugly. He's a weed. He's nothing too. So why does he? He doesn't look at her either. Yeah, but he still has power in the situation, doesn't he? He's still the one who's got the candy, and he's still the one who makes her feel bad about herself, right? Yeah. He makes her feel so bad about herself because he's not even willing to look at her, doesn't want to touch her hand, that she's imagining now and projecting onto the flowers themselves before these dandelions that she was championing and feeling better about, right? Even the dandelions aren't looking at her. Why? Because she's just had this negative experience of Mr. Yakubowski not looking at her. Right? Do you remember in that? Go ahead. I wanted to say something. All of this to me is connected with what she believes in again, with blue eyes that he has the blue eyes. He's so lucky he can't see her ugliness. And if she has the blue eyes, she will not be able to see it either. She all this this ugliness will be invisible to her, and she, that's why she feels like okay, he can't see me. So maybe if I get a blue eyes, I won't be seeing me like that as well, and all the ugliness around me. 
Well, she thinks if she has blue eyes, everyone will treat her like they treat Shirley Temple, mm -hmm. right? That she'll be able to, she'll be the center of the universe, right? Um, good. Uh, is she right about that? No. Doesn't add her own attitude, isn't it a vicious circle in some ways, right? She's so used to feeling ugly and being told that she's ugly and accepting that she's ugly that she walks around the world kind of projecting that a little bit as well. I'm not saying it's her fault. I'm just saying that if you have a sense of self-worth, it kind of enables you to look at the world in a better way, right, and be more positive. And because her family has not ever encouraged her to feel good about who she is and to feel that she has a right to talk, to exist, to have, I mean, she can't even speak to Mr. Yakubowski because in some way she feels like she doesn't have the right to speak. She hides behind her ugliness. She does hide behind her ugliness. And it reminds us, I think, of that initial passage about the breed loves moving into the storefront, right? Do you remember that passage where they have no memories there, they haven't created any happiness, and they've also made no impact at all on the neighborhood. After they're gone, the neighborhood's like, wait, who was there? What was there? We didn't see them. We didn't notice them. It's even worse than being hated and despised in a way. It's being made invisible, as if you don't exist, as if you don't matter at all. And that's what's really hard for her, I think, in the passage. Good. Very good. Uh, okay. Uh, my next uh, my next group. Who's my next group? It's in the page 60s or so. 61. Are you making it up? 61. 61. 61. Is that you guys? Okay. Tell me. You were right about the colors. Oh, yes. Winter, right? Tell me a little bit about winter first. I see you're cutting down page 61. But what about 61? There it explains the whole situation, how it starts, and it might be all old. Uh, all this ugliness around um, is the depression. It's a lot of sadness. It's, uh, it's dark and, and really sad. Would you let me read page 61? What time do you guys have? Oh, we have four minutes, good. Let me read this passage of 16. This is the new section about winter, right? And notice what the comparison is being made here. My daddy's face is a study. Winter moves into it and presides there. His eyes become a cliff of snow threatening to avalanche. His eyebrows bend like black limbs of leafless trees. His skin takes on the pale, cheerless yellow of winter sun. For a jog, he has the edges of a snowbound field dotted with stubble. His high forehead is the frozen sweep of the eerie, hiding currents of gelid thoughts and that eddy in darkness. What is the what is this figure of speech? It's a metaphor. Beautiful. What's the metaphor? When you're in the darkness and uh, and what's held in winter is this darkness and coldness. And okay, compared to what? Remember, with the metaphor, just like the simile of two things being compared. Oh, compared to the summer. Or, Not the summer. Her dad's what? Not his emotion. His face. His face is a winter landscape, right? Because he's got stubble, because he's got beard, it's like a, have you ever seen a, you don't see it too much in LA, but in, you know, there in Ohio, it's, it's cold and there's little bunches of, you know, on the surface of the ground, there are little bunches of dry, dead yeah. sticks and branches, and that's the stubble on his face, right? His eyebrows uh, bend like limbs of leafless trees. His eyes become a cliff of snow <coughs> threatening to avalanche, right? Um, wolf killer turned hawk fighter. He works night and day to keep one from the door and the other from under the window sills. Why is he a wolf killer and a hawk fighter? He's trying to protect the family. He's trying to protect them from what? From not being homeless, not being outdoor, just to work to keep even like when she was explaining how she was sick and through the window comes uh, cold uh, air, still though they have roof over their heads. Yeah, yeah. But just by the grace of God, right? Yes. I mean, he is, this is stress. Yes. This is the depression. He's trying to keep them safe, and that's his job. He's acting as father of the protector, right? Unlike who? Children. Children, right? Who puts his family out of doors. <laughs> He's described as he worked day and night and day to keep one from the door and the other from under the window sills. A Vulcan guarding the flames. What's a Vulcan? That should be on your vocab list. What's a Vulcan? <laughs> no, it's not Star Trek. <laughs> it might be, but not here. It's a Roman god of fire. Oh yeah, Vulcan is the thing that comes fire and goes down. 
It's for good and for bad, right? Because the God of fire, why is fire so important? Because they might freeze to death. Yeah. Remember, they're out there with the coal, one, you know, one missed paycheck or whatever. They're really right at the limit there. A Vulcan guarding the flames, because that's what's so important in winter. He gives us instructions about which doors to keep closed or open for proper distribution of heat, lays kindling by, discusses qualities of coal, and teaches us how to rake, feed, and bank the fire. And he will not unrazor his lips until spring. What does it mean to unrazor your lips? He will not, he will not stop until it's warm and it's uh, not so much danger. What's the image? What are his lips like? Sure. Show me. What's oh, a razor lip like, like? Like this thing? Yeah. Really it's deep. a straight line. Because why? What's his feeling? Well, he's cold, but it's not just cold. What else? He's stressed. He's stressed, right? He can't be laughing, right? He's got a lot of responsibility. On page 121, there's a similar. She says she married a man with a slash in his face instead of a <coughs> Right? This idea of having straight lips. So this, I want you to think about, you guys will go next time, but I want you to think about how this discussion of winter leads into your part of that morning, right? Because what she always does is she starts out with a general idea, idea, the ladies from Mobile, right? And then goes into a specific, I mean, how that specific relates to our main character for Poland. Okay? You're going to finish the book for Thursday. We'll keep up. Hold on to your sheets. You can ask them if you want them to be down. Just make sure that whoever takes them home.